Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Jia Gao. She is from Stony Brook, and she is a STEM professor at, uh, at Stony Brook University. She graduated from Stanford um, in 2004. 2004, and uh, some of you would know, um, uh, you would probably know her from from the bio stuff. Before uh, she graduated from the uh, special uh, gifted and special class <laughs> of gifted and young in in ninety nine yes in China that I went to grad school in Yes, All right, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so this is the talk. Uh, the topic: greedy routing with guaranteed delivery using easy flow. So I must say that this will have a little bit of mathematics and geometry. So I would like to make it accessible to everyone. But feel free to ask questions whenever you want. Okay. Um, this is joint work with a, um, a colleague, um, David Ko at, at Stony Brook, um, Dong Luo, actually a mathematician at Rutgers, and some of our students um, at Stony Brook. So the problem we look at is this problem of greedy routing. Okay, this is um, for wireless sensor networks. So you have a number of sensors deployed in the domain, and every sensor is supposed to know the location of its geographical location. Then we can use the simple greedy routing mechanism as follows. From a source, then we check among the one half neighbors which node is closer to the destination. And for that uh, message, we'll send to the to the neighbor who's making progress towards the destination. And we hope that this greedy procedure can be repeated and the message will eventually arrive at the destination. Okay, so for this algorithm, it is a really simple one. Um, um, we don't have any, we don't need any global knowledge of the network. Each node just needs to know its own location, the neighbor's location and the location of the destination. So it is compact and scalable. The problem with this simple algorithm is it doesn't work all the time. So this is a case when I deploy sensors in an environment, but there are certain areas um, that I cannot deploy my sensors. So this could be a building, this could be a lake. Um, and in this case, I may have a node so that all the neighbors are further away from the destination. So in this case, the message may get stuck at this node and greedy routing cannot deliver the message. Okay, so in this uh, picture, we have a hole in the network, and this hole is a cupcake shape. Okay, if a hole is convex, like the uh, figure to the right, um, you may still have the message stuck at the node. So in this case, you can think about the destination on the other side of the hole, and you say, you put a circle centered at the destination with the radius as the distance from the current node to the destination. And in this case, the two neighbors of X are further away from the destination. That's why greedy routing doesn't work. Okay, so the message again gets stuck at node X. And node X. Okay, so um, the next observation is, if somehow the hole is circular, Okay, then this problem will go away. So um, the destination must be outside this circular hole, and you can see that no matter where the destination is, the greedy routing using the locations will always deliver a message to the destination. Okay. So in um, the talk I'm going to give, the solution we propose is the following. So we are given a network of sensors. So a large number of sensors deployed in a region with all kinds of obstacles. Okay, these are uh, buildings of different shapes and I cannot deploy sensors over there. So in the network you can see the outer boundary is complicated and there might be multiple holes in this complicated shape. Okay? So what I do is I will embed the network um, using a VC flow algorithm such that all the holes are circular. I make all the holes to be perfect circular so that greedy routing using the new embedding will always deliver messages. Okay? Is it clear? So do all the sensors know about all the holes in the network? 
Uh, no, they don't need to. Don't need so to. this is a virtual virtual coordinate. So we compute this embedding. So every node remembers its position in this new embedding, and we can use a location service to do the translation between the node ID and its uh, uh, virtual so coordinate. So why circular holes always work? Okay. So and here so is the observation that is. Um, so if I have a destination, then I need to make sure that I must have a neighbor that is somehow inside the circle, okay? Because all the neighbors further away will have you know, larger distance to the destination. Um, so if you think that all the holes are circular, um, then... Um, so it's it, really, you always assume the next person who is in distance closer. Right. And if a circle, then it's okay. Right, 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 right. right. The progress we measure is the distance, including distance to the destination. So we always try to minimize this measure. Yeah. So, so what, you're, you're going to tell us how you make funny shapes in the circles? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so why why does it get stuck in x axis and communication breaks to the destination directly? Okay, sorry. <laughs> this is not communication <laughs> range. <laughs> this is just a circle to show why a message gets stuck. So if I want to find a neighbor using the greedy routing, I need to have a distance to destination to be closer. That means I must have a neighbor that is inside this circle. Okay, since I don't have a neighbor inside the circle, I have no, no way of making progress. So the source is to be the center of the destination. Yes. But then you need your next to go. So this this destination is isolated. So how can you go in the first place? Well, I know the position of the destination. So in, in this routing algorithm, I know my own position, my neighbor's position, and the destination's position. So I choose my neighbor closer to the destination, and if I find one... Mike says the circuit should be drawn central to the destination. Yes. But your next two features show the circuit is central at the empty space. So this is saying that if I have this uh, type of embedding, then you can see that no matter where the destination is, um, if you draw a circle centered at the destination with the radius of the current node to the destination, then you will always have a neighbor that is inside that circle. So that, <coughs> that uh, every node, they need to move to the particular location or, or that just for one transmission the source or any node, they need to compute this map by the, they, they have to work on this map? So we compute this map at the initialization phase. So after that, everybody is given a virtual coordinate. It is as if they're real geographical coordinate, but this is a coordinate just for routing. Um, so this map is fixed. So in the lifetime of the network, we do this map for routing. And to um, to execute this greedy routine, we just need to know the virtual coordinate of the destination. And with that, we use local mm -hmm. algorithms. So for different destination, you, you can use the same map, right? Yes. 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 Okay. So the nodes do not move at all. They stay yeah. where they are, but they store a different virtual coordinate around. Right? Any other questions? Okay, so what I'm going to tell you is how to change the shape of the network <coughs> so that all the holes are circular and green routing will always deliver a message. Okay, um, so for this, I will actually introduce uh, this mathematical uh, theory on VC flow. And VC flow is a procedure to deform a shape such that the curvatures on the surfaces are smoothed out. Okay. So um, the overview. How do you define failing? If, if I don't find anybody closer, I fail. I just give up. Yes. Yes, I give up. Why? Why would I give up? Um, well, you can you can of course develop new algorithms to help get out of this local minimum. Right. Um, there has been a lot of algorithms to do that. Um, but um, there are also issues with those algorithms. In particular, you know, one solution is to use phase routing. Um, and um, you know, phase routing also has uh, its problems. For example, it will very likely you know, follow the boundary of a, of a hole and it will overload all those nodes. 
Um, so this still happens with live reading algorithm, but I'll show you later on, second part of the lecture, second part of the talk, how to basically get rid of that problem. So to the bottom line is, on one hand, it's theoretically interesting whether we can use greedy routing to always guarantee delivery. And second is practically, it is appealing because it is a local uh, scalable algorithm that you don't need the global information and you can just make local routing procedures. Somebody has to know the global position before they make the virtual um, this reciprocal algorithm is a distributed algorithm, so we can run it in a distributed manner, so when it converges, every node knows its own virtual position. Oh, so they don't need to know the all the node position at no. the beginning? No. Okay, so are there any other questions? Okay, so let me just move on to the first um, part of the talk, that is uh, this very beautiful theory of uh, VC flow, okay? So let me just take a little bit of detour on this uh, mathematical background. So here I'm going to define everything for a two-dimensional surface. So this is a discrete surface, so it's actually a triangulation. So all the faces are triangles, okay? And with this, we'll need to define curvatures. So we know we can define curvature of every point on a curve. We can define curvatures of a continuous surface, but we can also define discrete curvatures for triangulated meshes. Okay. So here, um, I just take a vertex in this triangulated mesh, and I look at all the triangles attached to this vertex. Okay. So each triangle has a corner angle. I sum up all the corner angle and take the difference of two pi at the summation. So this is called the curvature, the discrete curvature at the vertex. Okay. So if you think about it, that if the summation of the corner angles is two pi, that means locally this vertex is flat. Okay, so it's has a curvature of zero. Um, for a point, for a vertex on the boundary of the mesh. I can define the curvature as well. So I again take the corner angles of the triangles at Z, and I take pi minus the summation. So if the curvature is zero at this boundary vertex, that means if you look at locally what is happening, it is a straight line, it is a straight boundary. Okay? So with this definition, given a mesh, I can define the curvatures at every vertex. Okay? So um, there's this very nice um, gauss bonnet theorem um, that says, if I gave you a surface, the total curvature of the vertices on the surface is a topological invariant. That means no matter how I deform the surface, I stretch it, I can compress it, I can do all kinds of funny things, but the total curvature doesn't change. Okay? The total curvature is equivalent to two pi multiplied the ordinal characteristics of the surface that only depends on the topological feature of the surface. Okay. In particular, this is um, the following number, two minus two times number of handles minus number of holes. Okay. To understand what is a handle, think of a donut. It has one handle. If you have a it's called double donut, you have two handles. So VC flow is a, a procedure that deforms the surface so that the curvatures change to the way we want the boundary to be. Um, you know, one uh, case is if I want to change all the curvatures, I want to make all the uneven curvatures to be uniform, I can use VC flow to do that. Okay? So just to understand a little bit of curvatures, so let's see what they look like. So what is uh, negative curvature? Okay, so it um, so this sort of points um, on this uh, uh, leaf have a negative curvature. Um, another figure is like this. So basically, if you span expand from a point, then the area grows a lot. Okay, that 
is an intuitive understanding of points in symmetric curvature. So it has the shape of a circle. <coughs> so positive curvature we encounter everywhere um, is to the contrary that when we expand the area um, does not flow a lot. A soccer ball has positive curvature everywhere. So a point with positive curvature has a look of a, um, a peak or a valley. Okay. So if I gave you a surface that had all kinds of bumps, uh, its curvature is not uniform. I can form the surface by using VC flow so that it has uniform curvature everywhere. And in that case, you will think of a closed surface and will just look like a, a sphere. Okay. So VC flow just says something very intuitive. If I gave you a closed surface, you know, no matter um, what the initial shape is, I can always make it deform it in a sphere. Okay. So this is the um, definition of uh, VC flow in the continuous setting. Um, so given a, uh, a surface, let's call it M, I can define a Riemannian metric, and this metric is nothing but um, to explain, to tell you what is the length of a curve on the surface. And VC flow in the continuous setting is to modify the metric, modify the curve length uh, proportional to the curvature. Okay, so the rate we modify the, the metric is actually proportional to the current curvature at this point. Okay, so using this differential equation, one can show that the curvature of the points on the surface evolves in a way like heat diffusion. Okay, so the curvatures will change over time, and eventually, um, at you know when this uh, when when this VC flow um, stops, so every point has the same curvature, and and that is the uh, uniform um, curvature surface. Okay. So it has been shown in uh, mathematics that this, uh, one can formulate a VC energy, and this is a strictly convex function. And that means there is a unique surface with the same surface area such that there is constant curvature everywhere. Okay. Um, in particular, this VC flow from the initial surface to the, to the final, the target surface, is a conformal map. And conformal map means if you draw a, a two curves that intersect on the surface, there is an intersection angle. Okay, so if I look at the mapping of the two curves on the target surface, the intersection angle remains the same. Okay, so to visualize it, so here you can see this is a um, computed by you know, using a VC flow to deform this bunny um, to a sphere. Okay, and then we map. Uh, checkerboard images okay, on the sphere, and we map this checkerboard images back to the bunny. So you can see that all the intersection angles remain to be 90 degree. Okay, so they are still um, orthogonal um, uh, you know, at every corner. Okay. Um, another way to visualize it is if you think about uh, the circles um, that are tangent, neighboring circles are tangent to each other. We have again map this uh, uh, texture to that surface, and you can see that circles tangent to each other still remain tangent to each other. Okay. So in our case, in, um, in our network setting, we'll do the following. So we start with a arbitrary shape, and we want to change the curvature um, such that for all the interior vertices, for all the interior sensor nodes. I want the local local curvature to be zero. That means locally I want it flat. Okay, and for the um, nodes on the boundary on the boundary cycle, I want the curvature to be such that the curvature is the same as the curvature of a circle. Okay, so that means given a arbitrary surface, given a arbitrary sensor network, I want to deform the shape such that all the holes are circular. And this will be useful for Fuji Okay, so um, everything can be done 
for the uh, discrete case, the VC flow can be formulated with a discrete case as a following. So when we say the metric of the of the shape, um, it actually means the edge length of the triangulation. So if I give you a triangulation, so each edge in the triangulation has specified a length. Okay? And all these lengths should satisfy triangle inequality, just to be valid. Okay? Um, so given a triangle with the edge length of the three edges, we can see that the shape of this triangle is uniquely determined. Okay, that means all the corner angles are fixed. Okay, this can be obtained by using cosine law. Okay. So given this edge length, because the corner angles are fixed, the curvature of every vertex is fixed by the metric. Okay. Um, so for this great VC flow, I will need to change the edge length to change the corner angles so that the curvatures will meet my target curvature. Okay? So remember that the VC flow uh, is a conformal map. So in the discrete setting, we also need it to be conformal. Okay? And here, there is a question, what do we mean by angle of intersection of two curves? Okay? And, um, just to get around this difficulty, we need to introduce another metric that's called the circle pattern metric. Okay, so this is again given a triangulation um, and uh, some kind of edge length of all the uh, triangles. And what I do is I will put a circle around each vertex such that neighboring uh, vertices will have their circles to be intersecting or tangent to each other. Okay. So for the two circles, there is an intersection angle. Okay. So this intersection angle um, um, is named phi ij. Okay. So the circle packing metric is a pair of um, functions, uh, the radius, the radii of all the circles, and the intersection angles of these circles. Okay. So given the edge length, and um, if I have this uh, radius, then I can determine the intersection angle uh, uniquely. Um, so this quick VC flow will preserve this intersection angles and will change the radius of the circle. Okay. So when we do the algorithm, when we run the algorithm in the, in the network, so what we do is we will change locally the radius of all these circles we'll keep the circles intersect at the same angle as before, and we'll run this in an iterative manner until all the curvatures of the vertices will satisfy our target condition. Okay? So, um, just to um, finish with everything, so this is the, um, uh, the reciprocal algorithm that we use this circle pattern metric and um, this means we have some circles of radius at each vertex and some intersection angles in the initial um, surface. So we take ui to be log of gamma i, and gamma i is the radius of the circle, and discrete VC flow will change ui proportional to the difference of the target curvature and the current curvature at the vertex. Okay? So in the end, every sensor node will calculate its local curvature and will change its radius proportional to the difference to the target curvature and all the sensors will do the same thing. So um, this, uh, this, uh, this, this algorithm is executed in a distributed manner until all of them um, uh, converge to the target curvature. Okay? So just to show a little bit of, the, a little bit of background, um, VC flow is initially proposed in 82 by Hamilton um, that shows like smooth curvature flow flattens the metric. Okay? And for the discrete uh, VC flow, this is proposed by Thurston in 85, and circle packing, circle packing metric is also proposed in that work. Um, the later work actually um, um, you know, finish uh, up with more understanding of VC flow, including 
um, whether the surface has a solution or not, and what is the convergence per theory, and what is the convergence rate. Okay. So in this talk, I will just move on to how to use VC flow in networking, how to use it for computing, embedding, for sensor networking. Okay. Remember that we will need a triangulation of the of the network graph. And uh, wireless you know, transmissions do not guarantee it's a triangulation. Okay? So we will need to first apply an algorithm to extract a triangulation of the network. Um, there are available literatures on that. Um, if we know the, the locations of the node, there are local algorithms to compute a triangulation, to extract, remove extra edges um, so that the remaining graph is a triangulation of the domain. And even without locations, we can select landmarks to build such a triangulation. Um, let me just give you an um, example of how to do it, even without locations of the node. So this is a bunch of sensor nodes deployed in the domain. And I will select um, landmarks um, rather uniformly okay, in the domain. And then I will compute a graph on these landmarks, and this is based on um, some kind of local conditions using uh, you know, similar LMA based ideas. Okay, I will not go to the detail, but you can calculate a kind of triangulation on these landmarks. And then we can use this triangulation, and we run a VC flow here, and we compute a new embedding of the network. Uh -huh. um, so is this mapping Uh, currently, it doesn't consider the energy distribution of the nodes yet. But um, I think if the nodes do not have uh, the same residual power, then maybe we can modify our embedding so that we select a path to favor those nodes with more energy. Actually, later I'll show you that there is still a lot of space to work with this, this kind of embedding to um, deal with network dynamics, to deal with jamming, that is links are broken, um, you know, how to select an alternative path to the destination, guarantee delivery, how to um, guarantee that you select multiple paths that are different from each other. Then for all of those, we need to understand a little bit of the network geometry, that is where are the holes. If I want to have two paths, where should I want them to go? Okay. So I hope those will answer some of your concerns. Okay. Is there any other question? Okay, so um, this is a, um, so by using either locations or this landmark based thing, we extract a triangulation of the network. And then we'll run VC flow on that triangulation, okay? So initially, we just set some arbitrary edge lines. Let's say all the edges have length one. And that means all the call angle is 60 degrees. Okay. And of course, if you have uh, this kind of initial lens, the surface, there will be non zero curvature distributed to the surface. Okay. And we'll use VC flow to um, smooth out the sur uh, surface uh, curvature and we'll let the curvature from each our target curvature. Um, so to make it work, we'll set the circle packing metric by placing a circle of radius half at each vertex. So you can see because the edge lines is one, so you have two neighboring vertices, their circles will be tangent to each other. Okay. That means the intersection angle will be zero. So in the iterative algorithm, we'll keep the intersection 
uh, uh, angle to be always zero, or other, in other words, you always keep the circle to be tangent to each other in the same way, and we'll modify the radius, radius of the circle to um, meet the target curvature. The target curvature would be, for interior purposes, we want it to be flat. And for orthonodes on the boundary, suppose that the total length of the boundary is C, then we will set the curvature of, of each point to be minus 2 pi over C. Okay, this will ensure that the boundary cycle is circular. So this algorithm is of an iterative nature, so it will run until the curvature difference is smaller than a pre-specified uh, threshold possible. Does the node have to know whether it is on the boundary or not? Yes. But this is easy to tell because if we know, if, let's say we consider what edge, we want to know if it is on the boundary or not. If it is not on the boundary, then it must belong to two other triangles, two triangles that share this edge. For all other cases, this edge will belong to the boundary. So locally, we can tell whether a vertex or an edge is on the boundary of the cycle or not. So um, using basic flow, what we get is edge length of the triangulation. So for each triangle, we have a specified length. And then we'll, have, we'll need to um, lay down the triangles to get the virtual coordinates of the vertices. So for that, it is really simple. Uh, we can just start from a any triangle, let's call it a steep triangle, we just place it here, okay? And then for the neighboring triangle, there is unique triangle that share a common edge. So we basically do something like triangulation in localization, then we pin down the uh, vertex of the second triangle. And um, this can be, um, this graph can be laid out by expanding from the C triangle one by one. Um, actually, this can be done in a parallel manner until all the triangles are laid down and we have an embedded protein, protein network um, with the, with the with specified uh, condition. Okay, so here let me just show you a number of examples. Um, the top is a network with uh, a number of holes, and then we actually map it to the right in the uh, embedding of the holes are circular. So this is another case with landmark-based triangulation. Again, we map all the holes to be circular. Okay. So now let's see how routing would work in this network. So this is a um, a routing down of the original coordinates of the nodes. Um, and you can see that um, actually this message gets stuck at the node on the boundary and all the neighbors are further away, so the message is, uh, cannot be delivered. Um, but in the virtual uh, coordinate space, the message successfully gets around a hole and arrives at the, at the destination. Okay? If we map this back to the previous to the true location, you can see this routing path actually gets around the hole um, automatically. Okay. So what if a node is on two boundary of two holes? Oh, um, there, that is a little, um, that is something I haven't uh, uh, dis, you know, discussed on the slide. Um, we would require that the triangulation is a triangulation of a manifold. Um, that means in this case you mentioned that one vertex being on two boundary is not allowed. So in case that if you have a network with this situation, we'll need to add some kind of virtual nodes to essentially place a band of triangles between the two holes. Then if in that case, will that distribution algorithm become a problem, do you think? Because you want to distribute calculate. But if you don't know other part information, you cannot, and you start from one point. So that is still local because that node on two boundary holes will just locally place a constant, you know, small number of virtual nodes, these are dummy nodes. And this is just for the use to generate this mapping. And after that, you can think about that this node is um, you know, taking up the role for, for all the dummy nodes. So all the, all the routing requests will actually 
go to this node. Um, so if other node, so there is no other node can be made, right? Or just it's, it's still it's just a local you know problem that you can do this local fix. So how do you know that the path you construct to respect to is um, uh, connected in, in the original graph? So when we do the triangulation, it keeps the connectivity to be the same for the original graph. So, um, and then we'll find a path in the triangulation. In fact, we'll just use the virtual coordinates to do routing in the original network. So we'll use all the non-triangulation edges. Um, but the property that all the holes are circular will guarantee greedy routing will never get stuck at any node. So there will be a path to the destination. Okay. Oops. Sorry. All right. So let me move on. Um, so here, I um, just actually did a little bit of uh, comparison with my previous work. And this previous work is um, also to compute some virtual coolness um, so that you, you can do really well. Okay. Um, so um, and this previous work um, use the what's called the Robert Van algorithm, um, but I will not discuss that in detail. Um, so what, what this says is um, our routing algorithm, our virtual coordinates will guarantee 100% delivery, and the previous one actually um, only guarantees about 80% of the message would be delivered using this virtual coordinates. Um, and we also measure the path length, that is how much longer the routing paths we get compared with the shortest paths. Okay? So on average, we get about 1.6. And the maximum path stretch, the maximum ratio, is about 3.2. Okay? Um, so this one um, shows the convergence rate. That is, how many iterations do we need to run to let this flow converge? Okay? So here, um, it depends on a number of parameters. One parameter is the curvature error bound. That is, how much error do you want it to be for the embedding to differ from your, from your target curvature? And another parameter is the step size. That is, when we change the edge length, how much we go proportional to the difference of target curvature. So the number of iterations is shown to be um, the following term that is log of one by um, epsilon over delta. Okay, so um, in our simulation, so we actually try out for different error bound uh, what is the number of iterations we need to take. And in fact, if you just want, if you want to have a really really small target error, you will need to take more iterations. Um, but very likely for our application to our application in really routing, we don't need we don't need the, the holes to be perfectly to be perfectly circular. We just need it to be such that really routing would work. So we don't need to do so many iterations um, like as, as demonstrated in the figure. So like just to get some intuition, yeah. right? So why is it that like is there a simple reason why you are doing so much better than no geo like they seem to be doing some kind of curving also right? i'm not getting a bit of from your previous slide like even so, in this diagram like what would be what is so different about like i'm not sure whether the 83 person means anything or it's only for that topology yeah it's actually only for that topology and i will explain why this topology is the um, is a, is a bad thing for, for no geo. So no geo essentially do the same to the following. So you first take the boundary nodes, you fix them at the, at the boundary of a box, okay? And for each edge, you treat it as a rubber band. You just let it go, okay? So this this is a graph of rubber band. It will stabilize. It will stabilize and generate a virtual coordinate, okay? And this will guarantee that you will always get convex holes. But convexity does not guarantee deliver it. You need to have circular holes in addition to convexity. That is the difference. Um, in this case, no geo has 80% of 
um, because the holes are concave. Okay, if you start with a network with holes to be roughly convex, then no geo does very well. But many others also do well. Yeah. So if you try anything with concave hole, you can see that the performance of no geo quickly drops. That's my understanding for the So, um, so the last, this slide is about some uh, theoretical guarantee. So I always say that guarantee is, uh, delivery is guaranteed. And here is what I really mean. So um, first of all, this block is a numerical algorithm. So whatever I compute cannot be the, the final, the, the whatever it converges eventually, right? So there's possible of small numerical errors that may show up and may affect the performance. But we never encounter anything because of numerical error. Okay? The second thing is, I show you that a message cannot get stuck at the boundary of a hole. But it may possibly get stuck at a skinny triangle. Okay? So this is the case that if you make this triangle to be extremely skinny, you may have the two neighbors to be further away from the destination. And the message can still get stuck at a skinny triangle. But this is um, easy to fix. So basically, you can change your greedy routing um, routine um, by saying that I do greedy routing on the edges or on the triangle. And then you can make sure that for the skinny triangle, you can always make it less in the correct direction. Okay? So the rest of the talk, I will actually look at the other issues in routing. So the first one, we focus on guaranteed delivery, that I want the message to be eventually um, arriving at the, at the destination. The second thing we look at is load balancing. Okay? So when you have a network with many obstacles, then um, you know, almost all existing algorithms will you know, try to deliver the message by getting around the obstacle. Okay? And, most, and many of them actually generate the paths that follow the boundary of the holes very tightly. Okay, if you do uh, GTSR, um, phase routing, then phase routing will just basically get around a hole and, uh, following and, and follow the boundary of the, of the hole. Okay? And what this means is the nodes will get uneven traffic over time. The nodes on the boundary um, are used more often than the other nodes in the network. So here, this is just a simulation result with the traffic um, accumulated on, on the network for random source destination pairs. Okay? So if a node on the boundary is used a lot, it will possibly run out of factory and then disappear. Okay? And that is a bad thing because the holes are actually large and the multiple holes might converge to each other, or the network might be disconnected. Okay? So to get rid of this problem, we actually want a uh, routing algorithm that does not you know, um, follow the boundary so tightly. Okay? So this is what we want to do in the second part. That is, given a um, you know, source destination, okay? so we actually get a um, embedding so that all the holes are circular. And if you follow greedy method, it will get around the hole and still follow the boundary a lot. Okay? So what we propose to do is to fill up the hole with another copy of the network so that when we touch the boundary of a hole, instead of following the boundary, we actually cut through it and enter the hole to another copy of the network. So this effectively is an in and bouncing back from the, uh, from the network boundary. And this will avoid using the boundary nodes too much, and this will effectively um, even out traffic flow. Okay. So here is what I'm actually going to do. I have a network with multiple holes. And um, what I will do is I will actually take the, the network and make another copy in the interior. And this is mapped 
in such a way so that the boundaries are actually glued to each other. So in some sense, I'm actually inverting the whole thing back into the whole. So this uh, this is sort of locally reflected. Okay. Um, to um, to do that, um, I will use what's called the Mobius transformation. Okay. So this is a mapping of the plane to the plane. So we look at complex plane. So we map complex plane to itself. And um, there is a very nice YouTube video that I want to show you um, that explains what the Mobius transformation is. Okay. So this is a mapping of the plane to the plane. Okay. Um, there are four. Um, um, elements in Mobius transformation. There's translation, which you map it to the plane when you translate it. And there's dilation, which is to scale it. And there's rotation. And the last one is interesting, it's called inversion. That is, if you take a circle, then you invert the exterior of the circle to the exterior of the circle. You map inside to the outside, you map the outside to the inside. Okay? So to understand, I mean, a general Mobius transformation might be the composition of the four elements. It could involve translation, rotation, dilation, and inversion. So this is a more general, complicated Mobius transformation. So to understand a Mobius transformation, it is better to look at a three-dimensional case. That is, think about you have a complex plane um, over there, and you look at C. Okay. So you can put a, a ball on top of the plane, tangent to the plane. Okay. And now you can map the sphere back to the sphere of the ball to the plane by doing this kind of stereographic projection. And then the four elements of Mobius transformation actually translate to three motions of the, of the sphere. Okay. So let me just go back a little bit. So translation uh, means you translate the sphere. Dilation means you move the sphere and you lift it up. Okay. And rotation is you rotate the sphere. And inversion is another rotation of the sphere in a different way. Okay, that is you rotate it so that north pole becomes south pole. So a complicated Mobius transformation is actually sort of a rigid motion of the sphere. So it's a transformation that is more complicated than rigid motion. So we understand rigid motion is just translation and rotation. And here there are more, there's translation and there is inversion. Okay? So in our case, uh, with the networking application, I will basically use re inversion for um, what I call reflection. So a general focus transformation um, is represented by a very simple formula. Okay? So this is just a function of z, and z is a complex number. So the four parameters a, b, c, and d, these are four complex numbers, satisfying that a, d doesn't equal to b, c. Okay? Um, in, in my case, I will basically use reflection for inversion. That is, take a unit circle, I apply this Mobius transformation to map the interior to the exterior, okay? And also map the exterior to the interior, all right? So for a general circle, at position C with radius R, I can you know, write down this formula that map everything outside to everything inside, okay? The points of the circle will stay on the circle. 
So what I do in this sensor network setting is I start with a um, general uh, network, and I use basic mode to make all the holes disappear. Okay, and now I just take a whole boundary. This is a circle, and apply Mobius transformation to map the outside to the inside. Okay? I do this for each hole. So what happens is the holes will be filled up. Okay, so when I map the outside to the inside, there will be still some small holes. These are smaller because these holes map to these other holes of the network. Okay, but a lot of the area has been filled up. There are still some empty space left, and I can do another level of reflection to fill up even more. Okay, so eventually I can do. Um, many levels of reflection and one can show that it's going to eventually fill up the domain that is the area or you know other kind of measure of the size of the hole will shrink to zero okay so in the um, case of routing let's say i have a source and destination so when i use greedy routing i will follow this uh, greedy routing uh, um, property and will possibly get to a node on the boundary. Okay, so without using this reflection, it will just follow the boundary of the hole until you can, you know, um, uh, basically leave the boundary and get to the destination. But here, I can actually go inside the hole to another copy of the network. In the original network, this is a if I'm reflecting back from the boundary of the hole. Okay, so in this case, the path actually goes to um, three different copies, but in the original network, it's basically bouncing back and forth between possibly multiple boundaries. And you can see we avoid using the boundary node too much, and this effectively reduces the maximum load on those boundary nodes. Okay. So, so every node knows of its neighbor is actually, he thinks it's here, but it's there. Can you find that in a distributed manner? Yes, yes, that I'm, I'm going to get to very soon. So this kind of reflection are the computed on demand. I don't compute in the reflection beforehand. Okay. Um, so what is happening is, um, before I get to the boundary, I don't do anything. Okay, only when I get to the boundary, then I think, okay, maybe I want to do a reflection, I want to go to the interior. And then at this point, I can just take the neighboring nodes on the boundary, I can calculate right there the geometry of this uh, boundary hole. And because Mobius transformation for this inversion just requires the position of this boundary, so I can compute the Mobius, Mobius transformation right there and apply it to the local neighborhood um, of that node to actually move to another copy of the network. Okay, so everything is distributed. So here, the routing algorithm is still greedy. Yes. So just uh, approaching boundary and use the visual topology to actually so load back. <laughs> but in this case, uh, can you guarantee the delivery? Yes, yes. Um, well, depending on how many levels of reflections you want to do. I mean, because there is a greedy path, right, from source destination when you fill up the hole. Yeah, I mean, depending on how many reflections you do, that um, essentially it determines how many reflections you may possibly have for the, for the path in the original network. But um, delivery is still there. So um, there is a theorem we can show that the total area of the hole is shrink exponentially for every level of reflection you do. And that means if you want the holes to be really small, to have area smaller than epsilon, then you don't really need log one by epsilon number of reflection. In practice, we never try more than five reflections. And again, all these reflections are done locally at the boundary nodes when the message gets there. Okay. Um, 
So just to get um, a little bit of idea like how much load balancing we can get, so here are some... Um, what is the trade-off of the number of... Uh, yeah, this is the very good question. There is a trade-off, okay? If you do a lot of deflection, right, then that means your paths go very deep into the hole. That means you actually make the path to be very long. Okay, so this is not a very good I mean, a very long path will give um, total load, a very high total load to the network. And that is not a good thing. Um, so here you can show that there is, in practice, um, some optimal number for the number of reflections you want to do. If you look at the path length, then here it shows the average path length, the maximum path length. And um, you know, for one level of reflection, the the pass length, the average pass length is the smallest. Okay. If you look at the traffic load in terms of average traffic load and maximum traffic load, it becomes good, like in particular for maximum traffic load, if you do two level of reflections. Okay. For a very large number of reflections, the paths get too long. That means the total traffic load imposed to the network is too high. And that's also not good for maximum traffic load. So I'm um, just using for a simple measure, like each packet comes one, load of one. And I'm just assuming that all the links are reliable, so transmission goes through for immediate payment. So every message passing through a node will add a count of one. Um, so, okay, so I want to just go to the last thing that is receiving to failure. How much time do I have? Um, it's 3 o'clock, but I think we can have another 10 minutes, can we? Uh -huh. yeah. I will just yeah. speak up on the last yeah. one because you basically get the idea. Yeah. Okay. The last one, basically, just to show you that there is lots of flexibility that you can explore using this embedding. Um, the reason is now you change the shape of the network to something kind of regular, right? It's, it's, a, it's a disk and there are some holes and you can actually you know, fill up the holes. So now you have a very good understanding of what the domain, what is the domain that you're working with. So by using that, you can um, try to um, find a path of the type you want. Okay. So here, um, I'm actually considering a more realistic scenario, the wireless links are not reliable. Um, transmission may not go through because of interference, because of jamming, or because of other um, you know, um, um, bad luck, like nodes run out of uh, power or they are damaged, etc. Okay? So for that, we can use this um, framework to do the two things. One is we may want to select paths that are sufficiently different from each other so that if one pass doesn't go through, likely the other one will go through, okay? And the second thing is we may want to um, select a different pass in route. So when a message gets to a node and the next link somehow appears to be broken, I can choose another embedding and quickly switch to a different greedy pass using a different embedding, okay? So, um, because I don't have a lot of time, let me just skip the first part and go to the second part. Okay. Um, so here, um, how do I recover from failure? So when a link fails, I want to find an alternative path. The good thing is the embedding I show you in the, at the beginning that all the holes are circular is not unique. In fact, you can apply a Mobix transformation on the embedding to get another embedding, and all the holes are still circular. This is because Mobix transformation would preserve circles. Circles will always map to circles. So any Mobix transformation you apply on this embedding will give you another embedding so that greedy routing also works. Okay? There are 
you can make many touching values and you can select them very easily by just changing the four parameters. Okay. Um, so what we do is suppose we have a message that travels to the destination, but somehow there is um, some kind of attack or the link suddenly is broken. We can um, compute another new value right there, like the, the one to the right so that we can switch to the second anybody and apply 3D routing in the second anybody, okay? In the second anybody, all the holes are still circular, 3D routing guarantees delivery. And I can choose the second anybody to make sure that the greedy path, at least locally, is different from the greedy path in the first anybody. That is, the broken link will not be on the path in my second anybody. Okay. This will make um, this will lead to an algorithm that can quickly recover from the um, the nodes would uh, need to know which embedding they're using. Uh, so we can attach this mobile transformation to the packet of the index as well. But these are just four parameters. Just four parameters lead to complex number, four complex numbers. So you just need to allocate four four bytes there. Yeah, <laughs> four bytes there. Yes. Okay. Um, so just to summarize, um, it, the entire talk is about transformation of the geometry of the network and the application to routing problems. Um, so we focus on greedy routing because greedy routing is local, it so has many opinion features. And um, by working around by, by working with the network topology and network geometry, we can actually make greedy routing to work and also have greedy routing with other good practice like the balancing, resilience to failures, and past for past diversity, etc. Okay. Um, the talk the, the talk covers a number of papers um, published recently, um, two um, two in um, RTSM and one in recent uh, Infocom. So all the papers are available on my website. You can go and download and the uh, slides are also available. Um, so are there any questions?